<laughs> Start us off. Let's do it. All right. So hello, welcome back to the Centerpoint YouTube channel where we're continuing our series on apologetics. And we kind of went through our other videos talking about the case for Christianity. And now we're going to be zeroing in on some difficult passages in the Bible, actually. Some things that when people read the Bible, they kind of have a hard time dealing with, or it might be a reason why they might reject Christianity. And the one we're going to focus on today is God commanding Joshua to drive out the Canaanites. Yeah. And this is often, uh, you know, brought up every time we see it in a video or something. It's all often says, it's often said that God commands genocide of the for Canaanites effect, yeah. for effect. There's a, they put a lot of effect. You, don't you know that your God commands genocide, right? Like, like, whoa, shock and awe strategy. Um, of course, you know, we'll, we'll get into it here. Uh, and it, there's a lot of different scriptures, right, yeah. that you can use to cite this. One of them is Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 2. So it goes like this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All the ites. All, every ite you can find, you know, whenever I drive, clear them away before you. Many nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, you will defeat them. You must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. So they take this and be like, see, he's commanding genocide on people. Yep. Um, you know, it's just a quick side note before we get going here. Canaanites are kind of referring to just a, a you know, we're just going to say Canaanites a lot here. And it really just means all the people in the region. Yeah, it's not really a specific nation. Yeah. Yeah. So is that true then? Is that what God is doing here? Kind yeah. Of <laughs> it seems up? like it. <laughs> yeah. But, and at a glance, right, if you're just reading in Deuteronomy, that yeah. might be your impression of it. What is going on here? So what is the context, I guess, of the scripture? It's always important to know the context when reading scriptures. And the context actually comes quite a few books before that. In yeah. Genesis chapter 15, uh, God is speaking to Abraham there, starting in verse 13. It says, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. So that's good for Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Yeah. So what, what's going on here, Ben? Well, it's really, Abraham is finally getting to... Uh, the promised land. Well, it's not really referred to necessarily as the promised land yet, but, you know, Abraham gets called out of uh, his home, says, you know, go to a land that I will show you and show, you know, Abraham shows faith and he's going and he gets to the land. And when he gets to the land, God tells him this, all right, you're here. And just to let you know that uh, for 400 years, you're going to be somewhere else and you're going to be really strange. Well, you're really going to be strangers in a, in a foreign land for 400 years. Uh, you're end going to end up being slaves at a certain point. And he really just gives just gives the whole like, you know, prophecy about what's going to happen. Then I'm going to bring everyone back here. And why am I doing this? Yeah, the last part is pretty key here. Yes, the last part is very key. He's like, why, why am I not just going to have you sit down and let's do it right here and now? No, because the people who live in this land, their, their sin has not yet, uh, what does it say? It has not reached its full measure, you know? So uh, what is this sin? Yeah, right. that's the question. What is God talking about yeah. here? Do we have any indication well, about that from we do have some from history? Scripture and some history as well. Uh, in in that region, in that land, uh, you know, the Bible actually warns us five times in Leviticus uh, not to sacrifice your child to Molech, which was a god that was worshipped in the region, and it's a it's the false god that the Canaanites did worship, and Leviticus eight. 18 and 21 is one of those verses and it goes like this you shall not give any of your children to uh, you should not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of your God I am the Lord you know it's funny because you know you could see the Bible's talking about there's people are getting 
they're offering their children to Molec. And we actually have some pretty good third party uh, evidence from a uh, historical source like Plutarch. And he notes of the Carthaginians. Now Carthage, Carthage is a place in Africa and they were, it was actually settled by uh, the people uh, of Canaan. And so they brought their traditions with them. And so, you know, Plutarch was noting of these Carthaginians who are of Canaanite descent. Uh, he says this, the whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums. Okay, now what is this statue? It's actually a statue of like this minotaur looking guy, mm -hmm. right? A, like a minotaur head and a guy who's, who's, whose hands are before him cut, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually his belly is hollowed out so that you can put, build a fire in it. And it's a big brass or metal statue. So you'd really heat this statue of Molech up right and so he's saying the whole area before the statue is filled with the loud noise and flute of drums which took the cries of the wailing so that they did not reach the ears of the people because what they would do is they'd heat up that statue and they'd place the children in the hands hmm. and they would just sit there and and you know burn to death and the baby would cry so loud that they would bang the drums louder and the flutes louder so that the parents and the people couldn't hear the screams of the children pretty grotesque yeah and, and the yeah. question is then, all right, this is awful. Yeah. <laughs> How long is God going to allow this practice to continue? Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to step in. He's going to judge these people. So how long is he going to wait? Yeah. So what are some attributes of God, though, that we see in the scriptures? Many times it says that God doesn't desire for anybody to perish, but for all to come to repentance. One verse two in Second Peter chapter three, verse nine says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Like I said, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So again, God, if you look back to Genesis chapter 15 and put these verses together, he's saying, hold on, wait, the sin of these people isn't yet, you know, complete, or I'm waiting for somebody to come to repentance, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take a pretty long time waiting for yeah. anybody 400, 400 years. years right 400 years of this going on of this going on you know yeah. it's been happening before then too and so he's going to wait another 400 years that just displays how actually patient god is with these people you yeah. know absolutely and we do have records from scripture of somebody coming to repentance yeah from the land from the land yeah which is rahab yeah rahab's one of them absolutely and uh you know it's it's this intersection of God's justice and love and his mercy, right? Like he wishes that they would repent. He wishes that they would stop, you know? Uh, however, he's not slow concerning his promise. And those promises are his judgment, right? Um, you know, a lot of times God gets flack, right? From atheists. Well, you know, why doesn't God stop evil? Yeah. Right? Well, here's an example. Right. Well, why did he kill all the Canaanites? <laughs> why yeah. did he kill them? He's stopping evil. He's stopping this horrific child sacrifice. Who knows how many chi you know, children they sacrificed. And that's just one description mm -hmm. of what's going on there. Um, and Lord knows how much more it is. And so, you know, he's waiting. He's waiting. But he's also, he's also a just judge to where, you know, if a judge, you know, if you convict, if someone, it's clear as day, they are guilty of this crime on video camera evidence and everything and the judge just says you know what i'm a forgiving judge i forgive you you can go free that's not that's not a, a, a righteous judge it's not a just judge at all you know the justice would be like no you you must be stopped you must pay for your crime and so uh you know that justice and his love and seeing and hoping that they would come to repentance at a certain point God is going to give in and say, all right, I must stop you to put a stop to what you're doing and all this sacrifice and all this. Yeah. So, you know. Um, and he used Joshua as his instrument of judgment. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because he uses all of us in a certain way as either instruments of, of judgment. And then he will go on when Israel starts doing some very wicked things. The same things. things. <laughs> the very same things. Yeah. Um, he uses, and you read the book of Habakkuk, He'll use a foreign nation, right, to do the very same thing that Israel did to the Canaanites because of for this very same reason. Um, and so it wasn't like God was targeting this nation, these no. Canaanites. Like, I hate Canaanites I hate and Canaanites. everything about them. <laughs> God hated the sin of the Canaanites. Yeah. And when the Israelites did the same, same exact, exact thing, thing, 
the same exact judgment came. So it yeah. wasn't targeting a specific group of people. It's not an ethnic genocide yeah. like they kind of painted out to be. Um, because in the Bible, you see, he, re- he does the very same thing. And, you know, um, one thing, one explanation that kind of gets brought up to kind of soften it. I don't want to soften the command to, um, you know, to complete, to, to, to devote these people to destruction. Because that is ultimately their judgment uh, that God has for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read the full uh the full context of the Deuteronomy verse because some people would say, well, you'll notice here God says that, you know, you're going to com- devote them to destruction, but then right afterwards he says, oh yeah, and don't intermarry them, right? And so what they're, they try to make an argument. Some Christian apologists say, well, you know, this whole like, you're going to come, you're going to devote them to complete destruction. That's just really this ancient uh, Near Eastern motif in writing. Yeah, they didn't really mean it. They didn't really mean yeah. it because you could see in all the writings from all the different nations, you know, the they would say, and we went into this battle and we completely destroyed them. We completely eradicated them when more than likely they didn't, you know, they won the battle. But they have this, you know, grandiose way of saying we completely devoted them to destruction. And so really they'll say, well, God's just using that very same language here. And you can see right afterwards, he's, he's warning them, well, don't intermarry them afterwards. Why would he give them that warning if he didn't, you know, if, if they were supposed to be all dead? So clearly you can tell he's just kind of using this nice or this, you know, epic language. And I, I would say that that kind of fails here. Let me read the passage again. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, here's a side note, God says, I'm going to clear many nations away from you. So God's going to do a lot of the driving out, right? So he's he's saying, I'm going to clear away many nations before you, the Hittites, the all these people, um, and all these nations who are mightier than you. Verse 2 says, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you, okay, so the ones that I give over to you, you shall defeat them, and you must devote them to complete destruction. Don't make a covenant with them. Show no mercy to them. Next verse is this. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters or to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. And, you know, you kind of... It kind of goes off from there. So and that's the idea. Like God didn't really mean that they would destroy everybody. Because look, here he is saying, here he is "Don't saying, marry any don't, of them after the fact." You know, but I don't think this holds any weight because you know, let's say if I have a ten-year-old son and I've got a corner market right outside my house and I'm making something, I need flour. You know, I'll say, "Okay, son, here's five dollars. Go buy a bag of flour from the corner store. Don't buy any soda. Don't buy any candy. Just buy flour." Well. You know, why would you go on to say those other two things if he's going? Right. Because here's the thing: they're going to be. T- he's going to be tempted to go in there. Ooh, candy. Ooh, soda. Let me grab some of that. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, flour. Uh, you know. And so God's really warning them: Hey, you need to do the first thing. All right. Don't. When you go in there, you might be distracted to intermarry with them. And don't do that. Right. Come. If I give any of them to you, devote them to destruction. Okay. Because that's their judgment. That's that's what they deserve. So. <clears throat> I don't think that explanation holds any water. Um, but anyways, we could keep on uh, going on. This. It's in this book, actually. It's, it so is in the, uh, I think it is in this book. It is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copan. Yeah. So It is a good book. So you'll see the argument come up yeah, a few times. You'll see it come up in there. Um, there's He answers a lot of great, you know, Old Testament. Wow, this is in the Old Testament kind of thing. And I, it's a really good book. It is a really good book. Recommend it, but there's just some things that I don't think are that good of reasoning. So yeah, and I think when, like we said, when you put it in context of why this is even happening, mm-hmm. and what the nation is doing, and that this is God's judgment on them, and that He's actually being really, really patient with them yeah. for 400 he's been years. Very he's patient. been extremely patient to the point where you'd be like, "Wow, why didn't you do this sooner? sooner. Like, why didn't you stop yeah. it sooner?" That I think it makes more sense. And I think another thing to keep in mind here is that from God's perspective, right? You know, we have a commandment, thou shalt not murder. And murder is really any unlawful killing, I think, is the actual Mm -hmm. definition for it. Now, for God to, God doesn't murder anyone, right? Because we murder, if I were to murder you, Kyle, it's like me ending your life, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm really, I am the guy, take God's reins of your life, and I put an end to your life, which only God can, you know, Mm -hmm. is supposed Mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Um, But for God, 
you know, for him and his point of view, it's just a location change. Frank Turk brings this yep. up, and it's, I think it's a good thing to keep in mind. When God is going to take a whole bunch of people and just kill them, you know, from our eyes, it's like, oh my goodness, he just ended a whole bunch of lives. But from God's point of view, he's just taking people from one place and moving them to another, right? He's really just taking the flesh off of them because God, you know, we're all really eternal. Like we're all, well, not, we're not eternal, but we're all going to keep on living after right. this, right? There, he's just taking off our bodies and m moving us into the afterlife from God's point of view, which is, kind of, I think, a little important also to think. Right. Like, he's just saying, all right, I'm going to stop these people and I'm going to move them into the afterlife. Absolutely. So uh, that's just a smattering of a whole bunch of ways to look at and think about these hard verses. Yeah, so, and there's more verses that we're going to be going through yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Um, like we said, there's a lot of stuff, especially in the Old Testament. Yeah. People have a lot to say about the Old Testament. <laughs> so that's what we're going to be doing. So hope you join us then and take care. Yeah. See you next time.